Luke Frost is a painter I always enjoy visiting. I think he has a great future. I first met Luke as early as 1980 when he was just four years of age. His grandfather Terry Frost was delivering a painting to me at St Earth Railway Station and in the back seat of the car was four-year-old Luke. Little did I know that over a quarter of a century later I'd be writing the catalogue essay for one of his first exhibitions, a sellout show in Plymouth. He's now artist in residence with a Tate St Ives exhibition due next year. Yeah, these are for the Tate. Um, got a show in January. Um, Year-long artist, artist in residence I'm doing. Um, it's been great. I've got the studio, which was uh, Ben Nicholson's studio and Patrick Heron's. And it's just, as you can see, it's massive. Great studio and um, I can do loads of different stuff, like big, really big work is what I'm concentrating on, on at the moment. Um, and they give me um, um, a materials budget which I can spend on whatever I want and experiment whichever, whichever way I want. Uh, as you say, the large size of the studio enables you to explore mm. Mm. a large scale, larger than, yeah. than you had in your Penzance studio. And I've always thought about your work that on the one hand, they have a sort of minimal-like physicality. Yeah. They're almost like physical objects. Yeah. Uh, and yet at the same time, I see in them a, a metaphor of infinite space, cosmic space or unbounded space. Yeah, well, that's definitely the case with them, um, with these ones, because uh, because um, these large paintings um, use the whole space, and the whole point is to uh, envelop the viewer on the whole on this wall with 21 feet of canvas. Um, with the space in between, it adds up to about 28 feet. So then, and you've got the colours reacting against each other, against the wall, the ceiling, the floor, and the, and the paintings themselves, the grey. So um, the whole point is to invite the viewer into, into a big optical world, in, you know, as they, as they look at it, yeah. So that's totally right. And, it is with, and with these larger paintings, you can just do that much easier. By dealing with pictorial art as a concrete object, you're entering into a relationship with the architecture of the room, yes. the light and colour of the environment, yes. and therefore it's almost like taking painting into a truly late or postmodern situation, <coughs> where it's painting, it's the grand tradition of painting, and yet you're developing the um, the uh, explorations of Mondrian, you know, where mm. painting was a was a kind of concrete object. Well, I feel, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, you talk about Mondrian, you talk about, um, well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I talk about other artists like Dan Flavin and um, uh, Robert Motherwell, as well as one I take from Colour from there, and um, Ian Davenport, the British uh, painter, and everything. I use that. I mean, those people have, that um, as a student. I looked at a lot and have, you know, taught me quite a lot, I think. And, um, and now I just, uh, I'm taking all that and taking the whole environment of the, uh, of the cultural world as well. I just try and bring it to my paintings, not just the artistic world, but the whole cultural world, the politics and other stuff and, that I look at. And it all just comes down to that. And I bring it into, yeah, hopefully that sort of comes across. It's very slightly, but to me, it does a little bit more. And you've even toyed with the idea of um, incorporating electric lights into yeah. paintings, because obviously yeah. your zips of colour have a sort of phosphorescent or yeah. you know, electric energy, if you like. Yeah, that is absolutely true. Yeah, the phosphorescent lights and fluorescent lights, um, as um, I've been looking at for many, many years, uh, every time I go out to go out to a, a nightclub or I go to big cities or everything and you know at night it's just they're everywhere and the colours like that or, if, or, or at night time looking down on the docks in the uh, like in the harbour there's lights on the boat sometimes coming through little gaps and very thin gaps and stuff like that and so I look at that and that I find is quite amazing and all these um, how light works against other different types of light how artificial light works against natural light and so I um, try and um, that's so that's where these come from these these you know vaults or zips as some people call them yeah that's what I try and incorporate in the painting. And hopefully, well, it does come across, I feel, anyway. In regard to what you've just said, mm. um, it seems to confirm in my own mind that your painting has a meditative approach. You've been thinking about um, artificial light 
yeah. as well as natural light, yeah. and about space and scale and uh, not describing the outside environment but taking key visual uh, effects from it. Mm. But I do see a, a quietude, a meditative approach in the paintings. They're not, they're not busy paintings, they draw you in. And they have a, a simplicity and a subtlety. Yeah. That perhaps promotes a uh, contemplative mood. The meditative part of them is, uh, for me, it's really, um, it's, all, it's, it's, it's a really big part of it. I mean, I spend my time in my studio and um, I turn the radio on and I have radio plays and most of the time I'll talk radio, like Radio 4, stuff like that. And I'll sit down and I'll just get the work in my head done at the start and then as, as, because it's, it's a process of making the colour, I mean, it's, um, it takes some, um, a few hours in the morning to get what I'm going to do and then after that I've got to do it so there's no thinking involved after that so it is, I just meditate, you know, I really am just in the zone. Um, it's quite calming, yeah, and um, the end result for me, it starts, the end result is a massive euphoria of excitement, um, I'm jumping around and you know, crack over the beer, you know, listen to some loud music, look at the paintings, yeah, and then after a while I sit down and I'm looking at them and they just, they have this um, ethereal quality where I'm just uh, in, the, in it completely and that's what, I, that's what I try and portray. So for a viewer, it's either, it could be everything really, it could be excitement, you know, and, you know, just being calm about what, you know, look at them, it's whatever you want to be really, to, you know, to them. What I like about them is, as I've said before, this, um dual experience. On the one hand they're immediately graspable and immediately recognisable mm. concrete physical objects yeah. and yet on the other hand they have this um, almost mystical subtlety, you know, this suggested space there yeah. this, that draws you in and obviously when you are painting them I believe you build up with many layers of, yeah. of paint, you know, yeah. which obviously <coughs> affects you psychologically as, <laughs> as, as the creator. Yeah. Undoubtedly, um, drawn in completely. Uh, um, the point where I think I'm going insane sometimes, where I'm just working on them, working on them. I'm looking at areas of just uh, centimetre square, and people look at you know my girlfriend comes on, you're mad, just getting involved in. But it's loads of those centimetre squares. If they're all exactly right, then it makes up the whole painting to be exactly right, and, and uh, I feel good about it. P people can't pick anything out of it that's. Uh, wrong but also it also makes but by, by but being so right it makes it completely right and makes them makes this effect that you can't get if you don't really make it perfect um uh, i mean the way i mean the way they work um with the layers and layers of paint um that is up to 10 12 depending on the consistency of the paint the opaqueness of the paint um the lines are the same and then it's weeks and weeks of fiddly painting to get them right, um, which can be uh, soul-destroying sometimes, but <laughs> you get through it. I love this um, effect in modern art of something not being what it appears to be. You know, I find mm. that really interesting yeah. and intriguing, and I'm also very satisfied with uh, discovering your work in the last few years. Um, I'm very pleased with the fact that, in the broadest sense, it contributes to an ongoing abstract tradition down here in Cornwall and yet, and yet equally you're branching out on your own doing something very different. I mean there aren't so many hard-aged no. uh, or post-minimalist painting that's been done in Cornwall. No. These paintings belong to an ongoing abstract tradition of painting down here and yet at the same time you're quite rare mm. among uh, Cornish modern or British modern artists in pursuing a rigorously reductive and mm. minimal language. Um, there aren't that many hard-aged painters down in Cornwall. There's tended to be a semi-landscape, gest mm. gestural expressionist style. I like to see that mm. quiet, quietude in your work. Yeah, um, I don't, it's something I don't th thought about a great deal when I do think about it. I don't know, maybe it's a reaction against all that. That's why I'm. Like this, uh, well, I think it definitely is a reaction against all that. When one studies art or looks at the legacy of modern painting, which we, you know, we've all inherited in our different ways, I think it's all too easy to sort of fi fidget and to be 
finicky and just to want to try something different for mm. the sake of it rather mm. than actually develop something that's already been done but to develop it uh, further yeah. and to stay with it you know yeah. rather than just neurotically try and f flip and change over to something yes. else. Yeah I mean I agree with that completely. Um, uh, I believe uh, well the way I have to work is I have to um, work hard, I have to really seriously work hard, seriously get into um, this is something I've been doing for 12-13 years now and um, it's, you know, I just have to keep going and going at it and hopefully you'll evolve into something, you'll get something out of it that actually becomes really interesting to you and other people. Um, if it doesn't, it doesn't, if it does, it does, but by flitting around with other stuff uh, in the beginning um, of your career can be uh, detrimental totally, but sort of, I mean some artists, say Damien Nurse, for instance, they can get away with it or are good straight away, but I know lots who uh, flit around and Need to, need to settle down for a few years and work on something really for a long time, yeah. Grey can be a difficult painting to um, mix and match. How did you get your grey in this? Uh, um, I've been thinking about uh, tones of grey for a long time. It's really interested me. Um, so uh, I set about well, the last six months, um, yeah, buying lots of uh, different colours and mixing lots of greys, and take a long time actually to mix all these grey to mix to get to this grey. What I've got up here, um, and these are three different greys as well. They're slightly toned, it's different. Um, but uh, it just really interested me, and um, uh, I felt that with these um, with this size of painting, this tone, like a grey or something like that, would. Um, uh, react better with the colours than something they say it was bright red or bright blue or bright yellow or orange because that I feel would then become so intense in the studio or the gallery that it would have the same feel. This has got a different feel to it. It's, um, you can uh, get immersed in it, you can float in it, you, you, know, um, you can um, dance around it but with something that's vibrant then your eyes would really be having hard work and that's, um, that's a different type of feeling that I do with other paintings but with these I wanted something, you know, something different. The uh, greys, were they a product of mixing or was it a, an outcome of superimposing glazes and layers to get that subtle effect? Well, to get to the greys, eventually I had to, um, well, I, lots and lots of mixing. Um, uh, lots and lots of mixing, lots of um, putting, putting it onto lots of paper on the, on the floor and just getting different tones of greys. Like you do with um, A level courses, you just you work out your colours um, theory by all these tones. I was just doing that as well, just putting down loads and loads of d different bits and going through it and then put them up on the canvas. They work, they won't. I mean, some didn't work. Um, eventually, the last few coats is what I want. And mm. I noticed on the edge of the canvases, the two or three inches, you know, where the canvas is wrapped around the stretcher. Yeah. I noticed that there's a certain roughness it, with the orange, for example, there's still a little bit of white of canvas showing. Is that a deliberate um, negation of the perfect <laughs> object? Uh, no, what happened, I'll take the, take the masking tape off that's underneath that, right. and you'll get, um, say, uh, I think it's um, three centimetres of the orange going round, and then the tape comes off, and you'll have about two centimetres, or three centimetres, I can't remember really exactly, of, um, of the canvas, plain canvas showing. Right. So, that just makes it just makes it just makes it all look really nice and neat and meticulous, meticulous, and it all makes them fit together.